Right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, good to see everybody back. Um, I hope you had a nice break. Um, not too much hassle with the families um, and some, some relaxed days uh, without work, I hope. Um, it's good to see everybody right. refreshed. Um, oh, this is me. Welcome, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Give me one second. <laughs> Not too much hassle with <laughs> um, and some it's kind of cool work, I hope. okay got it Why? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so, um, this is uh, the first of this year's, um, but not the first in the series, uh, lecture on the transformation of political violence, uh, particularly. Uh, perspectives on violence in the 21st century um, that I co-organized with Mario Rice in the context of the Trace Research Center and the Center for Conflict Studies here in Marburg. Um, hello, everybody, also online. It's nice you joined us. Um, today we have something special um, because we already had several lectures on political violence broadly conceived. And today we also have um, something that I think is new namely uh, responses to the violence. And I think um, this is really important not to just stay with analyzing violence. And sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming to see so many forms of political violence in the world. Um, yeah, why continue? I think today we will hear a little bit about hope also in the, in the face of violence. And I'm really uh, thankful about that, particularly about feminist responses to climate change. And, uh, climate change as a form of violence. And we hear that from Wendy Harcourt. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for making the long trip uh, to Marburg. Um, as many of us who do uh, frequent train rides to Marburg know, this can be quite complicated. Um, your, tr your trip was not an exception from that uh, general trend. But thanks very much for making it and taking the time. I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, Wendy Harcourt is a professor of gender, diversity, and sustainable development at the ISS. Um, if you, like me, are interested in agrarian studies, um, ISS is really a household name. Uh, but for those of you who are not uh, such a geek, um, it's the International Institute of Social Studies um, of the Erasmus University in The Hague. Um, Wendy has been a professor there for a long time and before that also a practitioner at the Society for International Development in Rome. Um, she has edited how many books? 14. 14, um, of which I cannot tell you all the titles, but um, of all the many super interesting publications that I really recommend you going to, I want to highlight two. One, um, oh no, three. One is the monograph of 2009 with uh, Z Books, Body Politics and Development, Critical Debates in Gender and Development. And very recently, adjacent to that, um, Reflections on the Violence of Development. Um, and I think that really speaks to many of the debates we have been hearing about in this lecture series, also the one we will hear about next week. Um, so I do recommend checking that out. And uh, last not least, uh, very popular, the co-edited um, book that just came out last year, and we've talked about that yesterday that it's quite um quite a hit um feminist methodologies experiments collaborations and reflections um and that's open access um so also for students go there uh, maybe it's interesting for your ma theses if you're interested in feminist methodologies i think that's really a, a great place to start um but i don't want to bore you too long with my um introductions i'm really looking forward to hear uh, what you have to say, Wendy. Thank you very much for joining us in Marburg. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk. 
Okay, well. Well, thank, thanks, Felix, and uh, thank you very much for Trace and for the, the Center for Conflict Studies. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm actually sort of halfway heading back to the ISS, so it was a nice stopover, just a little bit unexpected because of various things, which I'm reassured I'm not the only one to make mistakes, getting on trains that then move to different directions than you're meant to be going, for example. So... Um, always an experience. But um, I'm actually also very glad to be here because it's something that I can use as a platform really to sort of think through some of the issues I'm dealing with now. Um, and I think all of us are in relation to the violence of climate change. But as I was saying to Felix yesterday, I'd like to do it not from the sort of critical analysis. This is, you know, despair and what can we do about it in the sense of there's nothing, you know, it's all fear and gloom. But how can we think about it um, with a sense of hope and perhaps a sense of radical hope? Um, Felix mentioned, I, I've been working in international development rather than conflict studies, but obviously international development is very informed by conflict studies. Um, and is also informed by connections with very different sorts of people and very different sorts of relationships. So that's what I'll be thinking about. Um, and I have written, I was editor of a journal called Development, and I, I wrote about the violence of development a lot um, with a sense of that being the real core thing that we had to look at. And this talk is a little bit moving away from that sense of the violence of development. Although, of, of course, as you'll hear, it's informed by some of those concerns. So I'm going to be, uh, you know, fairly methodical about what I want to do. Um, I'm just going to be setting out some of the ways in which I understand what could be feminist responses to climate change. Um, along the way, I guess I'm going to be defining what I mean by feminism and what sort of feminist I am. But I'll leave that to you to ask questions if you need to, because I think if I started defining feminism and what is feminism, what is not, we'd be here and I wouldn't get on with the talk, right? So those of you interested, please do ask those questions. Um, I'm going to also position myself as somebody who's worked, as you heard, um, on gender issues. Um, maybe now I'd work more on intersectional issues, but I'll also talk about gender and then this violence of climate change as an opening. And then I'll go through my responses to that, which is looking at the different forms of relations that I think is the way in which we have to start to understand how to respond to this violence of climate change, going through economic, social power relations, and also relations of colonial power, um, which of course, as somebody working in development, I'm very aware of. Um, and then perhaps a bit more tricky for me as a social scientist and as somebody who is very much been about humanity and humanity's relations with each other, is also to think about how we can think about nature differently and the sorts of violence we've been doing to nature. So that's a bit of not exactly new thinking. It's been some years I've been trying to reflect on that, but I'd like to sort of talk about those relations and then move on to the sorts of responses, which I hope are really about hope in the sense of how to really um, move towards a repair of the violence that we've been living through and to do it through solidarity and allyship. Um, as you can maybe hear from the way I'm talking, I might have been a professor for now over 10 years at the ISS, but I've been an activist and a practitioner much more. So for me, that's what's important. What do you do about these things? And I think what you can do is tell very different stories. So one of these, the 14th book that I've edited, um, which is just accident of time, right? You end up doing a lot more than some of you have already done. But it, it comes from a project which is now, we're now um, we just finished. In fact, my Christmas and the New Year time we spent looking at the proofs, um, a book on contours of feminist political ecology. So I'll, I'll also share with you some of the stories from that book and then sort of conclude with looking at, well, what do I mean then by radical hope? And I hope that'll give you enough, um, let's say, interest to start some interesting conversations, as I say, looking at maybe what is feminism, but also maybe looking at what I'm describing as radical, and whether you think the stories that I'm telling are useful to your ways of understanding violence and the sorts of conflicts that your research is about. 
so as I've already sort of hinted at, but I think it's very important, and I think all of you should do this, whether you're feminist or not, it's always position from where you're speaking. Um, it's very important because there are so many ways of understanding whatever whatever topic you're you're talking about. So for me, it's important that I say that I'm starting as a feminist activist. That's where my knowledge is based from. And I've been always doing that. I'm, I've had friends who've said to me, you know, whatever, whatever position you're in, you're always speaking about environment, about feminism, and about the complications of what do you do about the injustices that you see. Um, as an academic, I've continued to do that by engaging in more research, going deeper into what that means. And I've come across in that sense, um, a lot of work that I'm engaging with, and I would say, in relation to rather than somebody who would claim to be working on degrowth or on anti-racism, but I would claim a little bit to be part of a post-development school. So just to position myself like that, and again, if you've got questions later, do ask me. Um, but most of all, I'm not speaking just as myself. I'm speaking as part of a collective, part of a long history of conversations, of places I have had the privilege to be in the sorts of books I've been reading, the sorts of things I've been watching, a whole range of collective knowledge and practice. Um, and one that unfortunately has always had a, a sense of urgency. We need to make change. And it's something of a, it's difficult for me to say that in these decades that I've been in, well, different sorts of rooms than this, but certainly in different spaces, always with the sense of it's unfair, we've got to do something about it. And we're still here feeling that we have to do it and we still need new imaginaries. But I'm, I'm going to stay with that. That's a very troubling feeling, right? That you've spent a lot of your life trying to deal with similar things in different spaces. But I'd like to sort of share with you what, what that could mean. Um, and I think it's because why I talk about hope is because it is such a scarce resource. We don't have a lot of hope in these days. Um, that's not because we're not wanting to make change, but because we just look everywhere and we see where violence rules. I mean, I don't even, you just have to, I mean, these days it's not newspapers, you open it, you open your social media and, and look at the types of violence and the problem of what's happening to the planet. Um, and we know that all, and I've been part of many of these conventions and treaties, they don't seem to be making those differences that we want to make it. Very disappointing, if not useless. But at the same time, we have to keep on to hope and we have to kind of think through what kinds of changes do we want. And my proposal to you is it's not so much about system change, that we need a revolution, we need to get rid of capitalism, we have to install a different thing than patriarchy. That might be one way of analyzing things or not sure what sorts of terms you use as the overall systems you're, you're trying to address. But I think it's actually more useful, at least I'm trying to think it through, in relation to others, in relation to different sorts of worlds that we could imagine. And to think about it as life worlds rather than systems that we're trying to change. So, that's from where I'm speaking, and that sort of sets up what I would like to do. As I said, I didn't define deliberately what feminism is, and I'm neither am I going to define what gender is. Um, again, I'm assuming in this room people are not going to say it's um, just about, you know, men and women are being different. It's about a lot of different ways of um, understanding relationships according to our sexualities, according to our identities, but also according to the ways in which we um, position ourselves in relation to others. Um, but in terms of climate change, it's still very much seen in, in the sense of there's a, a problem there, particularly for women in terms of their vulnerability to climate change. So my, my sense is that we still need to look at that, that there are gender differences in how climate change is impacting different genders. And I'll say genders, not just meaning men and women, in case, we, we again, we can open that conversation up. Um, but while we're saying that, what's important is that we have to see that those differences and the ways in which gender, uh, gendered people experience 
climate change and the violence of climate change is due to a whole range of complex historical, social and economic power relations. And those are the things that we really need to understand. And that's what's led to the vulnerability, particularly of marginalized women, and poor women. And that's that's a sort of, I just need to sort of also put that out there as, as a place to which we have to also start to think about climate change as having very different impacts on different people. We might be it, apparently on the same planet, but it has, I mean, we are on the same planet, but it has very different impacts according to where you're positioned and where you are. So that's an important thing in terms of thinking about violence. And the thing is not then to put a group of <clears throat> poor marginalized women, whatever it is you're looking at, into one particular box and say, okay, let's have a whole range of um, projects or policies or um, fundraising for those women to bring them into some other way of, um, of being, whether it's economic or society or culturally. It's more to say that is a very different sort of relationship if you start from being a poor marginalized woman in say Indonesia than if you are say privileged German white man starting in Berlin, for example. And that we have very different relations to climate change and to its impact. And that's something that we need to also think through and be aware of when we talk about responses to climate change. Who can respond? What sort of power do you have to respond? And why do you not have the same power as others? And what kind of vulnerability do you have to that? So for me, that's where also, Gender and climate change is important, um, and it's but it's important to see it not as a small thing, but as something that's related on different scales to other types of relations, particularly to economic power relations. And in this sense, speaking as someone who is teaching and been working in international development, it's also important to see that in terms of this dominant um, development narrative that. The solution is to um, green the economy. That's the way that you're going to change um, the, the, the risks and the problems we're having with climate change um, is actually one that is in ignoring all the different sorts of power relations, which are um, really creating the inequalities in which the problems of gender and climate change are founded. And it's something that we need to be very aware of as we think about the violence of climate change here and all the impacts, but also be aware that in the global south and in the ways in which it's impacting particularly marginalized women there, there are some very important and critical things that we have to address and have to look at in terms of a sort of bigger global picture. So it's not just about um, looking at what women themselves do per se, it's understanding the context, understanding the ways in which they've become part of a very different way of, of living. This, the green economy is, is in, bringing them into the market, but not in a way that is enabling them to um, be part of a, a, a different way of, of living that empowers and, work and engages them in ways that also and gives them a voice that enables them to then critique and work through some of the difficulties that climate change has brought about. Um, I'm going to go into that more when I get to the, the sorts of stories we need to tell. One of the major narratives of feminist responses then, so one feminist response is to say that it's not, economic power relations are more complicated than just talking about um, bringing people into the market. And it, it's about a lot of, a whole range of inequalities which need to be looked at as well. Um, the other one, Another one is also to recognize that it's not just about uh, work in the market, about paid work, it's also about care work and care relations, and particularly how much that is the work that, that women are doing. Um, mostly unpaid, and we, we saw with COVID very necessary in many ways that suddenly became visible at that moment, but is now rapidly becoming invisible again, although there's a lot of, um, there are nurses out on strike all over the world at the moment to try and get care work recognized. Um, but it is the social reproduction, this keeping the glue, allowing people to um, live, not just through a reproductive productive work is something that feminists are really trying to also um, focus on and ask that 
that these are very material and physical processes that also need to be acknowledged and have to be understood if we are going to deal with the violence of climate change and if we are going to be able to work with this, this concept of repairing the different ecosystems. So if you have the, the need to recognize that in, in the, the so-called green economy, you have many uh, vulnerable women sort of being brought into the market to, to, to bring about the sort of green economy, the sort of green revolution through the work they're doing. There's also all the work of care that also needs to be um, understood and taken into account. And something that feminists are also theorizing and looking at. Um, I haven't gone into that here, but again, there's a whole body of work which um, is is very important and and something that um, is, I think, one of the major contributions of of feminism to rethinking um, economics and has been for the last two two or three decades for sure. Another very important. Again, I'm I'm sharing with you sort of where my thinking is and what is important, I think, coming out at the moment. Um, and where care is important, a critique of green economy is important. What also is important is thinking about it from the, the notion of colonialism. And I guess in Germany, there's a lot mm -hmm. of decolonial movements, right, um, amongst students. And it's something that is certainly there in the Netherlands and uh, Britain and Australia, where I'm from. I should have probably flagged that, that if you wondered where my accent was from. Um, but this, for me, is the, the coloniality of power, the relations of power are something that are, have happened in the past and that we're building on. And it's not just enough to acknowledge it and the reparations and saying sorry. It's actually to realize that um, if we are going to deal with um, climate change and, and its violence, we really need to look at the kind of epistemic privilege that we've got, um, the Eurocentric ways of knowledge it has, and that we need to really try to disrupt that in very practical ways in the sense that we see happening right now with um, the protests around the Amazon. That's a very clear sense in which the coloniality of power is being disrupted. By, by, I mean, first of all, Bolsonaro's, again, I don't know, I'm re relating what I'm reading as much as you are, right, about what's happening in the Amazon. But to me, it's a very important moment that um, Lula has given indigenous knowledge and the importance of the Amazon immediate um, priority, even if it's also had this immediate reaction from Bolsonaro's fellows, uh, fellow um, followers. And similarly in Australia, the first thing that the new prime minister um, Albanese did was to say that he will acknowledge um, indigenous people in the constitution and immediately also had a reaction not quite so violent as the one in, in Brazil. But these sorts of ongoing now sort of resurgence of recognizing um, colonial privilege and power, to me, are very important and big hopeful spaces that maybe can bring about change and changes in ways that will be pretty, make a very different world, a very different kind of life world. Again, I hope we'll talk about this because it could, could be seen as sort of romanticizing, but for me, it's very concrete that we need to be starting to listen to different sorts of knowledges and indigenous knowledges which are recognizing um, the, the natural world. So I, I've put here a quote from Irene Watson, who's a, um, a lawyer from the University of Adelaide, where I was born, um, the first um, indigenous Australian lawyer. And this is what she has to say about the importance of um, how we have to listen to the voice and the knowledges of indigenous people. So I'll, I'll just, um, well, you can read it there, but just to, to uh, spell it out. We need to listen to the natural world constantly. Now it is changing, howling, raining, and drying up. We need to continually monitor dangerous extractive industries which might damage our natural ecosystems. First Nations have never stopped watching and acting. The non-Indigenous world needs to learn how to reciprocate and share the responsibility we have to the natural world. Perhaps it begins with some deep listening to the Indigenous world. So this is a, um, a, um, 
an important message and one that I would like you to think about and take seriously and how one can do that in terms of the types of life worlds that we could create is by listening to the more than human other. Um, so this is a, of course, we are aware that there's been a real anthropocentric uh, focus. We're in the Anthropocene. Um, climate comes from humanity's um, uh, destruction of, of the planet, etc. But actually, how do we respond to that is thinking about um, how do we then, as our own subjectivities, our own sense of being, how do we relate to the natural world? And how could we change the sorts of principles that we're living on that could be about living and nourishing others? And this idea of being in relation with the um, more than human other or earth other, I think is a huge challenge, but one that of course has been there for a long time and feminists again have been um, challenging that since the 1970s, ecofeminism was very linked to um, animal rights and to veganism, et cetera. And again, I feel a sense of hope that these sorts of um, ways of living are becoming much more accepted and understood and something that is not is seen as needed in order for us to really deal with the sorts of violences that we experience because of what has happened in the past. So I think that, again, these are... Um, listening to, as Irene Watson says, deeply listening to other knowledges, to pluriversal knowledges, to non-Eurocentric knowledges is maybe one way to understand how to make a new kind of life, sense of life worlds. Um, there are lots of different readings and, and feminists who are, who are doing that. The people I've quoted here, one is, uh, two are from the degrowth movement, um, one is from Germany, Corinne Dengler, another from Ecuador, Miriam Lang. Um, and they talk about reproductive commons, which would take into account the idea of social arrangements of care and the reproduction of life as a, as a way forward. Um, Stefania Barker, who's an it Italian who's worked for a long time in the Amazon, is speaks about the need to um, hear and work with sentient environments and recognize how different cosmologies, she's speaking here about different groups that she's worked with as an anthropologist, enmesh people in complex relationships between themselves and all relations. So this is also an invitation that feminism is, is ecofeminism, but also I'll come to feminist political ecology is saying in order to respond to the violence of climate change, we need a very different set of ethical relations, um, which recognizes the more than human world and starts to think about new kinds of stories, the sort of issue of the politics of hope, how political it is to say there's hope and that there's possibility and to move away from the idea of violence. So sort of halfway through here, I'm just saying, this is what the feminist response is to um, the violence of climate change, is that you really need um, care for climate, care for the earth, care for people and earth others. And those should be the values that we strive towards um, in our economic and political activities. But it doesn't start from just sort of an imaginary out there, it starts from where we are now. And I think that's the real issue of hope that there's lots of examples of people and people of very different natures than the ones that are in this room who are um, already working and trying to create new sorts of life worlds. And that's what I'm holding on to, because I think if you go the way of the sort of um, tabloids, I don't know, if those of you who read The Guardian, do you read? No, probably not, British newspaper. Spend a lot of time telling you all the horror stories, which are very real, but if you just keep reading them, you just wouldn't be bothered to just think, well, I'll just go away and wait for it all to disappear. Um, but I think it's actually important to see what, what is happening around us. So this is where, for me, feminist political ecology um, has been a source of hope. Um, I was, I have to say, very lucky that um, I got a, um, a Marie Curie grant that enabled me to put together a network of, of others who are also working on feminist political ecology, but most of all 15 PhD students who could then work with us 
um, that really builds on ecofeminist roots um, to look at how how do you uh, create ethical relations with the more than human species and how do you engage with restorative and transformative justice and really trying to create re re so I can never pronounce this word. <laughs> It's terrible. Reseparate sausage, yeah, whatever. It's terrible. You know, some words you just can't do. Um, I'll, I'll leave others to pronounce that. Um, community and care. It's very important to be in reciprocal relations with others. Um, and, okay, feminist political ecology, there's a sort of small group of people that have been engaged in, in thinking through these issues. Um, and in this network, we, we've done very focused work on it in the last four years, but um, and I've got a long list of people you can read if you're interested um, at the end, but um, we've also done it with others, particularly Community Economies Network, which I don't know if you've heard of, um, with J.K. Gibson, Graham, there's quite a few people in Germany who are also working on that, that look at uh, commoning and at um, ethical economic relations, beginning with uh, communities. Um, and also, as I've mentioned, decolonial feminism, fairly uh, complex set of relations there because it, it, it is quite different ways of understanding histories and understanding uh, what kinds of uh, knowledges and what ways in which we can work with different knowledges, but one that's been very um, important for, for, for us. And also, um, the sort of degrowth movement. And I, I, I was talking with Felix yesterday, the term degrowth isn't always the most engaging. So, but definitely the ideas behind degrowth movement has been important. And the idea, all of those groups thinking about how to have a flourishing life um, with ecological principles rather than just economic principles. So obviously that's a response to climate change as the result of, um, which I'm, I'm sure you've been speaking about, um, of, of violent economic practices and political and social practices. Um, so th these are important. So what I'm also, I think feminist responses again are to pay attention to the small details, um, to the emotions, to the ways in which people relate, to not ignore the fact that um, we're all having to live through um, now a very uncertain and difficult time. And a lot of the principles that we thought we could hold on to seem to be crumbling around us. So we're also aware of these sorts of disruptions, particularly when we were doing this project, um, it was called WEGO, um, which stood for Wellbeing, Ecology, Gender and Community Network. It's just an acronym you need like TRACE, right? You need these kind of crazy acronyms in order to get money. But um, essentially what we were saying is that we're living through disruptive times, which are going to continue. So what are the sorts of ways we can find to enable us to continue this? Um, and we looked at it from in different different places, but we were looking at it not only from the point of view of the big political economic picture, but also at the small embodied emotional picture of how people survive and resist and endure and create and, and love and enjoy. Um, so we were also very aware that the sorts of crises that many people around the world live every day, the more privileged amongst us also started to have to experience and live those as well. And I'm speaking here about COVID, but also about the impact of climate change as well, those sorts of violences. <clears throat> so I'm just now going to tell um, some, just a few of the stories. Um, yeah, what, it was till five, right? Oh, you're still, yeah, 10 to 20 minutes. Okay. Fine. So, I mean, I just wanted to share some of the stories because in these sorts of um, conversations that we're trying to have, I'm trying to set up an idea of a kind of story of my own, uh, a narrative of what feminists, how feminists are responding to climate change and the violence of climate change, with all sorts of assumptions behind it, which you can pick up with questions. But in the end, you also need maybe some sort of concrete things of, well, what actually happens when you pick up feminist political ecology as a way to analyze and as a way to be. What sorts of 
relations are, are you creating? Um, so I thought I would share just um, a few of the stories there. And I, I don't mean to advertise the book, but I will. Um, so this, co this contour is a feminist political ecology for those of you who are interested. Again, is an open access book. One good thing about EU funding is that you have to do uh, open access. So that means that people can download it for free. What Felix was mentioning is the other book, which we did during this on feminist methodologies, which to our surprise has got uh, 80,000 downloads. So open access gives a very big audience, a much bigger audience than uh, just an academic audience. 80,000 downloads of one book since April. I, I've been publishing for many years. That is a, a, a big response, right? So that's interesting to me that um, there's some sense of hope there too, right? That people would think that feminism, and if you had me talking 10 years ago, I would almost be hesitantly not using the word feminism because there was such a backlash. But I, I don't know where I am in this audience necessarily, but the fact that I've been invited and I'm able to say it's a feminist responses for me is also a sense of hope, but it's also interesting that the types of methodologies that feminists are using is also something that's captured the imagination. But the contours of feminist political ecology, um, and I should mention both books are not being done just as, as by professors. They're being done collectively and they're being done mostly by um, the, the, the younger scholars. And it's a way of also for them to explore very different forms of knowledges. If you're taking it seriously, how do you counter climate denialism and greenwashing? So the, the, the people who are here as the authors of this particular set of stories, doing PhD, so doing the, the things you have to do to, to get a PhD, but also doing a lot of activist work, going to the COPs, um, working in communities, organizing, um, uh, yeah, sort of resistances within the community, organizing also during COVID online um, art shows, which brought together very different places in order to talk about how you can counter climate denialism, um, showing what extractivism means for particularly the women in the different places they were working. So in this case, they were working in uh, in in um, with pastoralist communities in Kenya, um, with uh, people who are resisting fracking, oil extractivism in the UK, and also in the um, Indonesian Mahakam River environment um, with displaced peoples and the extractivism, how that impacted people. Um, and all of those stories are about violence and about the ways in which people were resisting violence, but they're also about hope and the way in which the researchers and as activists could engage and work with them to am amplify and open up what their experience was and share it in places like uh, COP26 and share it on, on the internet in places which uh, with viewers who would never have visited or seen those places um, and really try to as it says here, sort of weave together the stories, which normally would be seen as very far away and not to do with the, the same issues. So it was um, a very interesting feminist response to um, climate change in these small communities. But by amplifying the voices and by bringing them into different spaces, it also shifted it from just a research and analysis, but to a response that then supported the communities that, that the researchers were working with, and um, at least in two cases came from. Um, actually, all three um, were, were had come from those areas. They weren't necessarily um, living there at the time, um, but still. And I think it was also important um, there that the research was not only about what was happening materially, but also about how could you build relations, how could you build relations of solidarity amongst the groups and with the researchers and being very explicit about that was a very difficult process. So also thinking through how do you do research differently? How do you recognize relationships? And also how do you learn about other environments? That was also a very important part. There was a learn not only in terms of 
because of COVID, people couldn't necessarily go there, but sharing um, the experience through um, photos, through drawings, through the art work that they did. I, I don't have picture. I can, well, I, I, they have a website, but I, I didn't find during Christmas time, get permission to show it to you. Sorry about that. So that, that's one um, example. Another one which takes you far away from there is um, in, in to Japan, where the very different kinds of um, violence really um, it is. It's not so much climate change, but actually just the the violence of of deserted villages and older women growing and not having any more of the community around them and how they responded to that. I sort of slipped this in because I think it's an important, very practical feminist response to also acknowledge that there are very different kinds of um, ways in which you experience violence. It's not just about violence on your body, but also loneliness, um, the violence of communities disintegrating, the not being heard by um, people who are making decisions about funding or about even you know what kinds of um, support your village might receive. Um, the violence of not having any possibility to move from that place, even in such a wealthy country as Japan. So I, I thought this is a very interesting study, but also the ways in which um, the, the the two women who here, Nanako and Chizu, were looking at it were, was um, how these women shifted their relationship to each other and to the landscape and what they did with the villages, um, the deserted and uh, feral um, grounds, how they used those to do other sorts of work. And it came out that they were, they decided to have, to do small businesses and to um, do the, the sober noodle production, which became a, a sort of community economy and also a way in which they could recreate a community as older women, elderly women, um, from the age of 60 up to 90. So um, I thought that was an Im important, also interesting little story, which, which of course is, is explained very beautifully in, in the book, but it's one that uh, shows a, a way in which these elderly women could really create a new kind of life world. Um, and one that is not seen or made visible um, in, in normal understandings of what is happening in the politics and economy of Japan. So I just thought that was something also to say that one of the things that feminist responses are is to bring out the surprising or the not seen or the hidden and um, make it something that is also valuable and could be something that could be shared, which, which they are now doing by writing about it, but also sharing it with other communities, particularly in Italy, where, where I'm um, often living uh, with elderly women there who are also looking for ways in which to um, create community and be part of something that is not just, um, you know, in the sense they're not just left in, in care homes or whatever. Anyway, ask me about that if, you, if you'd like to. Um, and then the last uh, story, there, there are um, in the book, we've, we, we, we tell 12 different stories. Um, this one is um, in, in Mexico and it's in Mexico City. And again, it's about um, a feminist response to climate change is also then, okay, how do we envisage what's going to happen? And who is doing the envisaging? Who, is, who are the ones we're listening to about how we're going to cope with what happens? And in this particular project, it was talking to women market vendors in um, in Mexico City, um, people who are not seen at all as important policy makers about future energy resources, but people who have, of course, an idea of what is their future, what, what's possible. And it was all, it started with the idea of solar panels being put in the markets and them not working and what does that mean? So it, it moved from being a, like a project that failed solar panels not working in the middle of Mexico City to a project of, well, what is it that would be possible? What, do, what is it that these women would want to see? What kind of energy 
do they want to have? And um, what, how could you explore that with them rather than going with the assumption that the, the knowledge of how to put in solar panels, all very good for the environment, all very good to counter the impacts of climate change, et cetera, um, but do, doesn't work. Instead of seeing the market vendors as, um, as ir irresponsible, not taking care of equipment, turn it around and think, well, what is it that they would like to be doing? And what is it, what, what sort of knowledge do they want to do? Um, do they want to have? And the way in which the student did it um, was to create an app and, and play a game with them so, the, so that it was not a game, but a sort of uh, like a, a scenarios, like imagining their future scenarios. Again, read the book if you're interested, but it's something that, again, is hopeful. Like it's about hope. It's about saying that also these people have uh, important ways of thinking of the future, but also you can generate ideas with them. And something that also, it's not just about, it's a, this is about their, their life worlds and how they're recreating and, and creating it um, through interaction with researchers. So for me, it was also hopeful in the sense that the research itself built a community uh, through COVID at a time where people couldn't uh, meet um, in, in the way, well, I'm looking at all these people with masks on as if, um, we're still going through that, but at the time when people were really uh, were not able to move in the streets, etc. So those those are the um, the, the stories, um, and and I'd like to just I'll come to a close, right, to give people a sense of a time to to discuss. I've sort of thrown lots of things at you, um, maybe haven't defined everything enough for you, so or haven't told enough stories, whatever. So I'm looking forward to um, discussing it with you. But I think my main message really is um, that we have to learn to listen to hope in these small stories and these small resistances and do it with in the sense of solidarity and in allyship. We're not the center of the stories, but we're people who are engaging and thinking through and because of those stories, changing the ways in which we understand how to work um, to live in our world. Um, and I end with a, for those, I, I'm not sure any of you have heard of Joan Tronto, but um, a philosopher from Canada who has been working on the ethics of care for a long time. And this is a, um, a quote that is often used in feminist responses to, um, the, if you like, the violence of climate change. So if I could just finish um, just quoting her words. Um, so we need to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. Okay, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, yes, let's open the floor. Everybody can ask questions. Today we don't have a microphone, um, so just speak up. And Wendy, if you could quickly summarize the question, that sure. would be helpful for the people online. Um, so don't go on too long. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to ask the first question? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Wait a minute. This one oh, there there. is one. Perfect. It's less a question and more about your opinion. We were talking about power structures and ethical relations regarding climate change. And now, in the um, in the sense of the COP27 that happened in Egypt, uh, my question or your thoughts about um, the critique that the global north, north is trying to save or like climate change and put money. In uh, the global south and also in structures which are often corrupt and which is shown that often doesn't really have good output in it. So maybe it just yeah, what you thought about. Okay, yeah, thank you. So uh, the question was about um, COP27 and uh, the idea that um, the global north is giving, um, well, 
seeing itself as sort of saving the world, um, giving money to the global south. And in a sense, the responsibility is still with the global south, I guess. So there's my answer is that I think, um, and that's what I was saying, that, that that hope can be something we have to hold on to, because when you see the amount of um, money and time and energy that goes into these endless numbers of um, negotiations, which have, I mean, I've been part of it since the early 1990s and um, it, it's a bit of an oblique reply, but um, I was part of this conference in Miami, actually, 1991, which was um, the idea of a, a what was it, world's, what was it, world's Women for a Healthy Planet, some, some title like that. It was a fantastic conference in the sense that it had a very integrated, um, it didn't have no, it had, it was led by women from the global south it was a women's conference this is in those days um it had uh women judges it had indigenous um women leaders it had uh different civil society groups we didn't even have the term civil society in those days it had activist groups social movements and it was very much about working together and transforming the whole world and the responsibility of the north and i remember i was part of even if I'm Australian, I've lived in Europe for this long, I was part of the European group. And we talked about responsibility as consumers and what we had to do. So each sort of region was speaking about what was important that had to be looked at from that point of view, right? Um, and that we took into Rio 1992, which was, a again, the first time you had a very big conference looking at um, the earth and it was called, you know, there's this earth agenda and whatever. If you look at those, they were much more radical and much more holistic and much more talking about life worlds. Um, and there was this sense of hope then because it was the end of the Cold War and people were really thinking that we could use the sums of money that were going to not be about keeping the Cold War going into peace dividend. I'm probably talking about things you already know, but anyway, I, I was just, just reflecting on it. Peace, the peace dividend and a shift to completely different ways of working. And um, the idea was that we would have, uh, I mean, a very much more equal economic base, et cetera. Now that, that vision um, in a sense is still upheld in some of these little documents, but the reality is, is not there clearly. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm very cynical about those. It's not only about corruption, it's just a sort of, um, yeah, as a feel good thing that you go to uh, Egypt and do something. But at the same time, I, 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 I would like to say that there are other things happening that uh, may be more important than those sorts of events. And we're sort of led by the social me by media to think that this is where decisions are made. I I I would say, I mean, maybe Felix or others could come in. I mean, th there are different places where um, we can negotiate and do things. Um, and maybe that's the, the question for all of you is that where, where we have to create an analysis that's very um, nuanced and doesn't just talk about global north and global south, but looks at the different relations and how that works. I don't know if that's helpful for you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I forgot to say, please introduce yourself quickly um, oh. for uh, uh, for the question. Ivana, you want to go on? Ivana Kuzinska from the Center for Conflict Studies. Um, I I would situate myself and she is a feminist uh, peace and conflict studies um, scholarship and practice in that sense, uh, scholarship as practice. So I'm, uh, and I'm not, there is some work on the ethics of care, at least in the peace and conflict studies, from a feminist perspective, but I'm not really familiar with the literature. Um, and from where I'm coming from, and I think we've heard this many times before, I'm kind of, I feel a little bit uneasy with the kind of ethics of care and kind of using female attributes in order to achieve radical goal. And to me, that doesn't seem very radical. I'm sure there is a, Debate within academia, I'm not familiar with. So, I would like to push a little bit to you and maybe um, explain us how we can juxtapose a more radical feminist agenda that is an hour for the security agenda, for instance, um, and kind of ethical care in that sense. 
Okay, thank you. That that was a, a question about, um, you know, how it is the ethics of care which attributes sort of power to um, feminine ways of being. Is that a radical agenda or is that a basically conservative agenda which is not going to get very far and that in as I understood it in uh your work in in peace and conflict studies there is work on the ethics of care but you 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 question that and, and are concerned about it yeah yeah so good so so that 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 leads me to so mentioning that not familiar with it but there is this radical feminist agenda so um <coughs> very good question and and an important one um because as you said i've i've you hear it a, a lot and i i've sort of slid around it a, a lot in my own work as well um in the sense that um i would have said five years ago i am definitely not eco feminist i do not think that women are biologically more able to um care more for others or be more peaceful um that 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 it that it's a much more complex question than that and that um, eco feminists have made it very um let's say uh, uh yeah they've simplified things in order to sort of create a, a sort of opposite power so you're still in this dualism of you know men patriarchy bad um, women and sort of whatever feminarchy would be uh, is a good thing. So I, I, I take that point, but I'm I think ecofeminism that I'm referring to and the ethics of care that I'm referring to it, it is um, a much more nuanced thing, a, a much more thought through thing, um, and is about acknowledging that care is a very powerful thing in itself that care can be something that is about power and dominance and is also about, um, creates all sorts of possibilities and spaces if you use it well. So it's sort of the opposite of greed or, or violence, but it can be of course about dominance. And John Chantu, who I mentioned uh, right at the end, has a whole different range of what kinds of care we're talking about. So care with others rather than care of others, for example, is a much more powerful and much more aiming for much more equality um so there's also masses of care um which is one of the books that i i, I flashed up there with maria Puig de la bella casa she's also looking at it as a um you know a, a different level of the ways in which we can look at uh, relate to each other that is not about being a woman or a man per se so um my talk perhaps has been uh rather holding on to the idea that um, care is a powerful and important um, way of being that if we all embrace it, it's important. So it's not just about women doing it, it's also about men or about whatever um, gender you want to be. So in that sense, um, it's perhaps more idealistic than, than, uh, than anything else. But I also have gone back and reread Echo Feminism um, because of this project, this Wego project, and realized there's uh, people like um, uh, Val Plumwood, for example, who talks about Earth Others, actually has some very important philosophical ways of understanding care, which would be useful to, to take up. But I've also gone back to someone like um, Hugh Stretton, who's a political um, theorist um, from the 70s, who also looks at care in very different ways. So I think uh, it's it's something for me, um, it's an ongoing project to understand what the ethics of care means. I, I'm actually involved right now in, in, in that project. So um, it, it's, it's uh, much more powerful than I thought it was. And it's not just about what do you say in Germany, sort of uh, church, Kirche, Kuchen, I don't know, there's some, I've been in German audiences where they quote this at me, that it's, a, you know, the sort of motherhood thing, we need to get away from it, yeah, so so it's not not about that, it's not about celebrating um, some essence of, of womanhood that needs to save the world and hold the planet up, I totally get why we need to ask that question, yeah. Okay. Um. 
Ja, weil wir jetzt an die Charakter ein äh, Sociologist Connected to the Center of Conflict Studies and the Sunday from Mr. Second part of my talk this morning, because I was also talking about the ethic of care, and I would agree, I would um, distinguish between ecofeminism and this and um, care ethics debate, which is um, mainly about connectivity and um, conviviality and about a normative and um, ontological shift that we need. Um, and I'm also connected to the field of development studies. So um, my question, and maybe you have um, also heard these questions um, many times, um, is, um, is it necessary? And if so, how um, would it be possible to upscale these local experiences to present in the end? Yeah, that's um. Yeah, you're right. That's the question of upscaling local experience. How do you bring that into the global arena? Um, one of yeah, that's something I remember actually in in at the heart of development. That I think that's what it's all about, right? People think oh, we've got this sort of um, this worked. So how do we reproduce it somewhere else? How do we move it to somewhere else? So the the chapter that I was mentioning, which was looking at sort of um, extractivism and resistance and greenwashing sort of stuff, they were trying to connect not by upscaling, but by connecting, by the relationships, by saying that there are there is a pattern going on here. How do we share the experience across, not 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 via the research, but with the people speaking as as a community in a particular place but with the links to others so to move it away from the sort of development hierarchies where you get you need the expert and the and the evaluator and the and the funder but actually to to move into connections and as i said i think that's happening all the time anyhow with social movements etc so often um yeah i i worked in the area of development for a long time but I often see that it's a very tiny area actually, and it often doesn't see what else is going on um, because it's so busy looking at the kind of expertise and funding that you need. And nowadays presenting beautiful, um, surprisingly well thought through models that could then be applied, but then don't work. And I think that that's still an, an issue. So I don't think it's a matter of upscaling, it's a matter of connecting and relating and trying to take it seriously that relationships are built through time and we have the possibilities of course with internet to do that and I think at least when we were doing our project with 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 this Uyghur project we, 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 we just had to of course everybody went online and you suddenly saw the possibilities of via translation google translate through all sorts of ways we were able to in a small way make those connections but I've long I mean I, I've been in those huge UN meetings where you think yeah, leading to the MDGs or leading to the SDGs that, oh, we're going to make, this is it, you know, we've got the blueprint that's going to change things. Of course we have it, and we never, we never did. But I think to sort of let go of the idea that you have to upscale everything is probably an important one, politically speaking. But that requires a, then a, a different way of, of moving. And it's sort of ironic, this idea of going slowly and connecting when you feel this sense of, you haven't got much time, but I still think that that's the ways in which, um, at least when I saw um, the kind of work that was being done, it was completely different from the traditional development kind of speak that um, I've I've got used to criticizing actually, um, both when I was working in, in that field more and when I've been teaching it. I, I hope that answers a bit your, or at least starts a conversation perhaps more than anything else. I'm sorry, I, I wish I knew German and I could have come and listened to you um, this morning if you were speaking in about these sorts of things. Uh, I have a question myself. Um, I've been thinking about this. Uh, what is the violence of climate change? Because, um, so for example, as we speak, uh, people in Lützerath, small village um, to the west, uh, are trying to save um, this village, which has been evacuated for the biggest uh, German energy company to take out the coal that is still there in a kind of shady deal with the German government to continue coal mining until 2030. Um, 
And these people who are protesting against it, they perceive the violence of climate change pretty drastically and directly by the police who is just now beating them up and trying to, you know, throw them out. Um, and I've been in that situation. Um, but at the same time, I'm a perpetrator very much when it comes to climate change. Um, and probably most of us here are contributing to climate change and thereby to the violence of climate change that um, other people are at the end of. Um, so analytically speaking, I find it quite hard to pinpoint it because it's not a direct form of, you know, master-slave kind of relationship. It's also not, it's also different than say, a classical image of structural violence. Um, what is it? Um, I know it's a, maybe a big question, but um, how do you conceive of the violence of climate change? Um, people will have heard that, will, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So it, it's really a, a conceptual question of how do I think about the violence of climate change? I was trying to talk about in terms of relations of power, right? So that um, indeed, you you probably have to look at the the context you're just describing, and then look at the ways in which not so much it's nothing about scaling up. It's just seeing how those things are connected, and maybe looking at it. Um, not only as sort of, yeah, the, there's the police as an embodied material form and what they're actually doing themselves and how they're also involved in um, that violence of, of, of climate change representing something else and try to break down all those different relationships. To me, that idea of um, being with and relating to and with others shifts your way from thinking away, away from big systems to sort of a much more um, ecological sense of things moving and changing and fluid and, and becoming together into something that we can, we have to look at differently than master-slave relationship per se. So uh, perhaps that's why I'm turning more to philosophers who are looking at that connection. And if you talk to um, natural scientists, to um, marine biologists, or people that are studying um, the impact of plastics on seas, or uh, looking at, uh, yeah, impact, you know, whales, what's happening to their, how they're communicating through plastics. They also see all these connections of um, relationships of the whales to the boating, to the fishing, to the production of plastics in a very different way than we're seeing it. And it's also how to uh, monitor and track and understand what's going on. So to some extent, I think we have to see the connections and, and the, how things relate much more. But I'm not, I'm not uh, um, a theorist in, in that big sense. Um, but certainly, like, um, Pereg de la, de la Casa, she, she is more theorizing about matters of care and care being the thing that you can look at shifting and changing as well. So I guess, um, so you, the description of what's happening there is violent, but there's also going to be um, care about from, there's also happening not only the violence, but also the, the care for that village by the people who are resisting. So maybe you can also look at those relations and how you strengthen that and how you act in solidarity with that rather than as well as, but maybe more focus on the care element than on the, the violent and the police and that systemic element. I don't know, maybe you have to do both, but I guess that's what for me life world is about, right? But yeah, great question. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much for taking the time and speaking to us about this. Um, this is about uh, the climate change debate in Germany again, in my perception. Um, a lot of the resistance against um, steps that a lot of people might perceive as necessary to sort of combat climate change, I think comes from, the, from people feeling um, left behind in a way or lectured to or condescended, you know, by, and there's also, this is also about a generational divide uh, in a way, I think, about older people feeling like they're not part of the um, discourse anymore or um, they're, they're being lectured to by people who maybe have less 
that experience than they do. So I was wondering, do you have any advice maybe or any ideas of how these ideas that you have about sharing um, community experience more than lecturing to people, how that might transfer to those discussions that we're having? Oh, thank you very much. That's a really great question. Um, so you were asking about um, the debate of climate change in Germany and what is the intergenerational debate about and that older people feel that they're left out or being told by young people they're to blame and then, well, what do you do about those sorts of lack of communications given that I'm saying that there should be building community? Yeah, so great question. Um, and, and one I totally recognize, I don't think it's only in Germany. Um, there's a whole range of uh, kind of... Um, let's say older people's guilt as well that 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 um happens that you you i'm of that generation where people say oh we were so lucky we didn't have to think about all these things and now we're to blame you know how do we deal with it so people get uh, get lost in that um there's also young people blaming as well so there is sort of real uh, tension there um i i think it is to do with um taking a step back and of course not not blaming others but actually saying well we're in this together um and that the uh the histories that we might know and analyze and that maybe old older people can help think about those because they were there i mean i was just giving my little two cents worth of what happened in this conference in miami but actually um listening to that and then also hearing the gaps in that like well what didn't happen there why wasn't that there what, what could we be doing differently? I mean, let's not just hold on to some idea that it all went wrong, it was all right then, but actually uh, learn from those histories because I think the issue of environment and inequalities, economic inequalities and social inequalities has been there for a very, very long time. So it's good to be uh, revisiting those debates, but then seeing what's shifted and what's changed and, and different generations listening to one another. Um, I agree with you. It's exactly not to have, sorry, I'm not criticizing this, but this kind of is not the best environment, right? Mm -hmm. This is totally not what we should be doing. It should be sitting together or um, talking through me, hearing a lot more from you, you hearing from me. So we have to break down some of this structure that's going on, I would say. Um, and, and in my own teaching, I, I do try to do that. And I, I'm sure others of you who are um, here also do that. You're very aware that learning and communicating and the process of doing that is, is incredibly important, not only in schools and in universities, but in the home. So that's where this sort of idea of care is important. So um, what I mean by that is not, you know, my mother should care for children, but that we should care for relations because that's what we have in terms of how we can really learn to change what's happening in our environment. And for sure, as a white Australian settler uh, origin, I've also had to stop and learn about how indigenous Australians care for country in a very different way than I do. I can because of the types of knowledges they have. And that's what I meant. It's slightly awkward to talk about that because you, I'm not trying to incorporate their learning into what I'm saying. It's more saying, hey, that's also there. And that's more than intergenerational, that's intercultural. And that's also very hard to do. Okay, here I am speaking English, you all, of course, that's not your language. We've got all of those things to overcome, but I think that's also very important. But the intergenerational, debate is important both ways isn't it so to respect the sort of histories and that's also what indigenous cultures do they respect the histories and the narratives of older people and uh, also to nurture young people's visions and what they have to do there's a really great question and it's one that I think you should be asking always right and um, I as an older person also have to learn to give the space to younger people as well to speak, which is not happening right now, but I normally try to make it make it that way. I think the, uh, the, the questions show that we are um, working with very new to us and find it very inspiring. So I, I want to ask another question that I'm sure you've heard many times. Um, <laughs> 
quite a, a nice sort of um, help if you get the answer to. What about state civil society innovations? Is there a dependency in environmental activism or also to say that state the state has a responsibility? It can't be down to the individual and I understand that this the community is group um, to solve big problems. Um, and how would the problem for ethics of care and conventional um, feminism? Where would the state or other, it doesn't have to be an organization state or governments? It must be on a supranational level, an international institution. How would they fit in with rules and regulations um, regarding environmental protection? Okay, great. Another great question, difficult one, um, which is saying, um, I don't call myself an ecofeminist, but as a feminist political ecologist, how would I see the role of the state um, in relation to civil society? And, um, you know, I've been speaking about community, but what what is community in relation to the state? Yeah. Um, the thing is that as a feminist, of course, um, and as an environmentalist, of course, the state is responsible in terms of the governance and of the... Um, I mean, hopefully, democratic governance of 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 the um, both the peoples and the land which it's responsible for. The reality is, it's not just a state. It's what you just talked about the, the the extractive private sector, and it's about a lot more than just the state. So often, the state might represent um, you hope a sort of democratic will to go forward and to make changes, but often it doesn't have the power to do so. So the the um, ways in which I think civil society should be working with the with members of the bureaucracy in the state at different levels. So this is maybe where your local community is very important that you're working with local um, officials, with local communities, and recognize their difficulties as well in terms of what they're having to take care of in terms of people and what type of funding they need. So I, I don't dismiss the state, but this is me, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who would, um, but I think for as feminist state has to provide a basic um, balance between people who have and don't have. I mean, all of those sorts of issues for me are clearly state issues. But um, the, the tricky question of the in United Nations and these um, bigger networks, well, I mean, World Bank, IMF, all these others, I think that's where we, that gets into more difficult areas. So I'm more comfortable thinking of the state in terms of local states, not even national states have got more complexity to them, but they're, they're clearly important. You can't, uh, you have to be working inside and outside of those structures. I mean, I'm in, in a university, you know, this is a state university, right? I'm also working in a state university. Of, of course you want those resources there to be part of communicating, bringing about change, et cetera. So, um, okay, I, I could say, I, I could answer it very differently because there's also the huge areas that the state shouldn't, I think can't really engage with and it can be very problematic. But for me, uh, for the sorts of things about care and care for um, others who aren't able to, I mean, I think it's a state responsibility. That's what I, I, I mean, again, I'm talking with myself. It's a great question because I'm I'm struggling at the moment to to write something about state and care and I haven't really come out either way on, on it. But at the moment I'm still, as, 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 as from my own work as an advocate, I've always seen the state as as crucial to bring about le the legal changes needed. Um, but uh, we talk about violence, not so much violence of climate change per se, but violence against women. It's clearly also state responsibility. But at the same time. For example, um, I, I just read a, a wonderful PhD thesis um, in, said in Mexico, where it was saying that um, legislation for abortion was actually um, very complicated and um, negative for many women. And actually they were advocating a non-state intervention for abortion, which we, we could talk about later. But so I'm starting to see maybe I'm of a particular generation which sees the state as important. This is where listening and learning from younger people is also important. Yeah. We do have time for one more question, if there is one. Yeah. 
um, I am Asian, I'm studying aesthetic at the moment. I kind of wanted to go back to the um, vision of God again. Um, this is a couple years, but there's a song in which uh, I think it's an instance too for someone. Um, there's something along the lines of that 95 percent. This is probably not like I think it be, but you know, the idea that 95 percent of the world has forgotten to be indigenous, and then now it's up to the rest five percent of time to teach them again. And I was, um, the, yeah, the oh yeah, no, that's like, um, no, sorry. How, for example, in, in Europe, we like what is indigenous in Germany? What is indigenous to our you know way of living from our land? We don't really know that anymore. I think probably a few islands like Faroe Islands or something we still know, but do you have any thoughts about like how how we can discover that maybe? Is it even necessary or? Yeah, okay, that. thank you again for a great question. Um, so it's, it's asking me, um, yeah, what, what does Indigenous mean in Europe? Um, and what do we, what can we really learn from that when we are already so divorced from whatever this Indigenous means? So great, because I get to clarify a little bit uh, what, what I was trying to suggest. So um, for me, this idea of life world and there are many different life worlds, so sort of there are pluriversal ways of understanding. Um, it's about listening to some of these other ways of caring for country, as uh, Indigenous Australians say. So it's not saying that we have to then care for country in the way that Indigenous Australians do. It's more recognizing that that sort of epistemic knowledge is very valuable. In the case of Australia, it's they they knew much better how to deal with the bushfires which are now raging because of climate change. They knew much better about what happens with floods, right? And that knowledge is getting lost. And so it's important to start listening, not only now, but it should be part and parcel of how we deal with what's going on in terms of climate change. Um, so that's in terms of in the ways that that's sort of a very practical material thing in Australia, perhaps. But in terms of um, also the value of caring for others, um, and that's also, I guess, people are learning that from Indigenous peoples, is that they're saying, we're not divorced from the environment where you live. So it's fairly crazy. The imagination that created this room, for example, this is not going to survive climate change unless we really rethink our energy sources, rethink how we communicate, rethink what education is. Um, and that's learning from people who, I'm not saying you everybody goes back to live in a village or whatever, but it's more trying to think, well, what was useful about what you knew then? Like what are the survival resistance, whatever skills that are there and how can we incorporate them into our life? So it's not a becoming indigenous, it's more acknowledging that there was some important things that we've lost because we've swept into something that's created this violence of climate change. So it's again like listening to um, other narratives, if you like, and seeing what you can work with. And I'm not saying there's a sort of perfect other indigenous world and we should become that. I'm saying, well, there's something to learn there. In the same way, there's something to learn from. Yeah, you know, um, dead white men, if you like, which is so anathema to decolonial scholars. Of course, we have to learn from different sorts of knowledges, and how do we how do we work with those? I don't know if that's helpful, but I wasn't trying to say, oh, this is. It's more listening, deeply listening. Also means bringing your own self into that conversation. It's not about stepping back and saying, oh, well, that's you know, you've got it and I've got it and we're sort of like this. It's more saying, well, how do we have conversations with one another? How do I respect what your knowledge is and how do we work with that? And that's, I think, I mean, I, I'm I'm sure I'm being completely naive here, but that's what I think Lula was trying to do in his statements in these days. And that's what I think the resistance is so strong <laughs> as well for that reason. I don't know if that's helpful, yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Thanks again.
Um, I just wanted to say um, that next week, again, we have a great uh, lecture for you. Um, the title has slightly changed, um, but it still melts Ouzu from uh, Cambridge. And they will talk about alchemy and violence, a decolonial approach to peace. Um, so we are very much looking forward to see you again next week. And uh, have a good start into the new year. Uh, Wendy Harcourt, thanks very much again. This was brilliant. Um, and have a good evening. Thank you.